But again, those are all things that are in concert with his will. Look at verse 14. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? And who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? If God created all of this, who explained to God? Now this is the way you need to make the universe. This is the way you need to put it together. And by the way, when you make those human beings, these are kind of the laws you ought to make so that they can get along together real well. Yeah. Even with the the divine wisdom of God, how did that work out? <laughs> hasn't worked out too well. It's not until we approach God and uh, attempt to come to God on His level that we begin to understand that His way is perfect. Isaiah 59, verses 8 and 9. Oh, I'm sorry, 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Wherever we go, God's already been there. God is so far out ahead of us. And that's why the instructions of God are so important to us that if we can understand, if you watch the movie Lincoln, came out a few years ago, when Abraham Lincoln is talking with Stevens, the guy who is a radical, what we call the radical Republican, he's an abolitionist, and he, he wants equality, absolute equality right now, and he wants to uh, take uh, property from the landowners in the South and give it to the slaves, and he wants to do all kinds of stuff that's just going to really upset social order even more than what it already was by the, the, the war. And he said, he's talking about, well, you've got to have this moral compass that's pointed north, and you've got to stay on north. The, you know, where it's pointing. And Lincoln says, I, I used to be a surveyor, and yeah, a compass is good. It will show you which way is north, but it does you absolutely no good showing you where the swamps are, and where the, the rivers are, and where the cliffs, and I'm paraphrasing it somewhat now, where the dangers are. For that, you need a map. A compass just points you in the direction. But a map will show you the things that you need. And that's the way it is with God. It's just not a pointing thing. God will lead us, if we'll allow Him, around the dangers. He'll point them out. He'll say, hey, watch out for that. Look at the book of Proverbs. Look out for this. Be careful of that. Hey, watch out for those women over there. You know, all kinds of things that you just don't get from having your nose pointed in that one direction and, and just going and going and going. You've got to be aware of the circumstances around. That's the way God's thoughts are in teaching us because His ways are higher than our ways. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. Well, that's to us because God knows the depths of His judgments. He knows how perfect His ways are. It's us that need the understanding, right? And sometimes, I, I, I like some of the things that are coming out right now. Uh, you can't just tell people the truth. Sometimes you've got to show them the truth. You actually have to let them see the evil before they're going to understand the difference between good and evil. You've got to expose them 
in some way to the evil of what evil is so they get to understand it. God could have protected us. God could have put us in a shell of some sort to walk through this world. How would that have made us better people? How would that have made us, would have made us stronger people? It wouldn't. But it's going through the problems of this life, the, the heartaches of this life, all the problems of this life that will either make us stronger and draw us closer toward God, or it's going to make us hard-hearted and drive us away from Him. Those are the depths and the riches of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His judgments, His ways, they are so great. For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has been his counselor? Well, nobody, really, but we can understand some of the parts of his mind, and we can receive his counsel. And that's the important part of it, isn't it? Not to be God's counselor, but to let him be our counselor, our chief counselor. For who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? God, you owe me. God, you owe me. I did something for you, God. Now you owe me a home in heaven. It doesn't quite work that way, see? Verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. God doesn't owe us anything. But look at what God gives us. The best thing He can give us, apart from His Son Jesus, wisdom. Wisdom to walk the right way. Wisdom to understand Him. Wisdom to understand the counsel that He gives us. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The book of Genesis tells us that God spoke the universe into existence. Can you imagine that? Not abracadabra, okay? Not presto changeo. Uh, my, my favorite one now is uh, Whamma Lama Bama Lama Rock and Roll's King. There it is. <laughs> that, that song gets stuck in my mind, you know, I like it. If you watch the video of it, you know, with the cartoons with, with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all those uh, movie scenes, you know, that's, that's going through it, it's just, you know, I don't know. Call me crazy, please. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, there you go. That's me. Well, the, God just, and, and God the Word, let there be light. And there's light, and, and, and you know what? It wasn't the sun, and it wasn't the moon, because they don't come along for a few days later. What light was that? It must be that ultraviolet light we've been talking about here recently. <laughs> that, that light that you can't see. Well, there was nobody there to see it anyway. So what difference did it make? But, but light is the essence of, 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 of so much. And we talked about Jesus being the true light this morning, right? Uh, but what did the light do? And what did all of this do as, as God's Word spoke? Well, remember at the beginning, the material stuff was created, but there was chaos. So everything that God the Word spoke after that moved from chaos to, can we say, order? To a universe that worked, that what we call a cosmos, an orderly universe. But what happened? Created man, created Adam, then Eve, Adam be seen. Marred God's perfect creation beyond repair. And I think we miss that sometimes. I think we miss it. And 
I think there are some groups that really miss it far off because it's like uh, Adam, how could you do this? God fix it. And God says, I can't fix it. You're broken. I can't fix it. But the beautiful thing is, God says, I can make it new. <laughs> I can make it new. And, and that's what he does with us. He can make us new. He can't fix us, but he can make us new. We go around trying to fix people. That's not what we're here for, right? We're here to make people do. That's what the new birth is about. God can speak that into existence. Life as God intended for us to experience was inexorably changed. Mankind was cursed with consequences that we cannot escape. Except for one thing. Or two things, really. Two things. Death or the Lord coming back. It's the only way for us to get out of it, right? That's it. Because he's not going to, he can't fix this universe. He's not going to fix this universe. He's going to destroy it. He's going to make all things. Isn't that what the Bible says? Behold, I make all things better. I make all things better. Mankind was alienated, alienated from God, from the very loving God who created them. Oh, can't fix the problem. Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a passed away. Behold, the new has come. Revelation two uh, twenty one five. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Write this down. Write what down? Behold, I'm making all things new. Well, take what man, because of the devil, broke, I'm going to make it new. But I'm going to make it new because I give man an opportunity to turn away from rebellion and turn to service to God. Serving God. Through the new birth. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That shows the greatness of God. God immediately initiated a plan to save us from the consequences of our failure. When I say our failure, humankind, all of us, right? God worked in the family of Abraham to create a special nation. He chose, why did he choose Abraham? Because Abraham trusted God with the unique faith. Second, God brought his family into Egypt so he could powerfully lead them out of Egypt. What? God, if you were going to set them up in the promised land, they were already there. Sometimes God needs us to walk through some terrible times before he leads us to where he wants us to be. He had to take them down to Egypt, make them slaves, and bring them through the wilderness wandering before they were... And even when they came in, they weren't ready. <laughs> they weren't ready. Remember what he did to Egypt? Ten plagues. You know what those ten plagues represented? Ten plagues against their idols. Everything was against things. Everything, every plague was against things that they worshipped, including their firstborn sons. God preserved these people on a hostile desk for 40 years. Their clothing and 
Do you realize their clothing and their shoes did not wear out? I wish I could bear them. My boots. My boots will last a long time because I only wear them on Sundays, typically. Okay? But my my regular shoes, you know, my new balance, uh, new balance shoes, yeah, uh, they wear out in about six months. Why? Because I wear them. Man, 40 years their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothing did not wear out. God fed them with manna from heaven, gave them water out of a rock, which they didn't appreciate a bit. He preserved them when the enemies attacked them. He brought the faithful into the promised land, though, didn't he? Oh, at all those hard times, he, he brought them through it, you know. Fourth thing we note here, God continued to work his plan when the nation worked against him. What did they do? As soon as they got into the land, what did they start? Going back to their idols, right? And uh, they continued in that. They neglected the commandments of God. And God did not stop his plan. He didn't change his word. It was still intact. I mean, he had the work. It was like in the road, the map I talked about. He had to go around some things here and there. But he, all his plan came to fruition eventually. He accomplished his purpose by sending his son and our savior to this earth. And Jesus Christ revealed the good news about God's salvation. We talked about the gospel this morning, didn't we? That good news. Jesus Christ was rejected and betrayed and suffered a criminal's execution. Three days later, God raised him from the dead and declared him to be our Lord and our Savior. The fulfillment came after some hard times, some very tough times. But that's the greatness of God, and that's that's the greatness of God's plan. It's one that it, it finally comes about, and we've survived to get to that point. We can look back and say, "Thank God! Thank God! He's God's." Now let's look what God did. Christ was raised from the dead. Because he was raised from the dead, okay, and there, there's, there's the power of the resurrection is involved here. He took people who despised each other, Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't like each other. They fought against each other, right? He took people who hated each other, Jews and Gentiles, right? And he took people who thought they knew everything about God's inspired writings, the doctors of the law, right? People like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, others, so many too numerous to name. People who were totally ignorant of God's inspired writings, people who knew absolutely nothing about scriptures at that time to those people, to people who were, who, who had worshipped idols, and he took people who had worshipped him, took all those people, all who at that point in time and from that time on, who would believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and place them in his church, the kingdom of his dear son. what God did. we got a plague going on in this world, apparently. Supposedly. It's what the news says, right? We can't get Republicans and Democrats to sit together and talk about it. Trump that picture. Look what Jesus can do. Look what God can do. Take people who are enemies and bring them together. 
Okay? And God still is adding is still adding people to the church. He's doing it the same way that he did it at the very beginning of the church. By placing all who trust and obey him in Christ. In Christ, not on Christ, not under Christ, even though that's kind of a true statement, but in Christ is what the Bible says. By making all who trust and obey him one in Christ. You know what that means? Equal. Equal in Christ. Isn't that nice? Don't we wish we were all equal in our nation? I mean, that's what the Constitution says, isn't it? I think that's what the Declaration of Independence says. Do you feel equal? In this nation? With the things that are going on? <coughs> chicken wing her. Do you feel equal? Or do you feel like some people think they're better than other people? And should get away with, with things because uh, that guy is who he is and that woman's who she is. By placing the sins of all the trust and obey him on the dying body of Jesus. You have to get back to the cross to do that You know, that's what Romans chapter 6 says that baptism is doing. Taking us back to the cross and back to the grave so that we can be raised with Christ. By forgiving all who trust and obey Him. Do you think those Republicans and Democrats are going to forgive one another when all of this is over? Do you think they're going to find ways to, to bash one another? just a totally different way. Look for another excuse. Yeah. By cleansing all who trust and obey him in the blood of Jesus. Boy, that's a powerful agent right there, isn't it? I think we need some of that for politics, maybe. By purifying all who trust and obey him and making them holy. Now, understand, making them holy, holy doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Holy means set aside for God's use. Israel was holy to God. Does that mean they were perfect? Not by any means. Does that mean they never sinned? No. Does that mean God saved every one of them? No. They were set apart, but they did not fulfill their mandate. We've got to be careful. We are set apart. We are sanctified for God's work, for God's use. We have to make sure that we fulfill that mandate because if we don't, we'll suffer the same fate as they do. Uh, and number seven, by sustaining all who trust and obey Him every day with His providential grace. Every day. Providence. Providence of God working in our lives to do what? Feed us, clothe us, put a roof over our head, right? Give us what we need. We, we, we may not be the richest people on the face of the earth, but we might be the most blessed. And that's what happens. It's because of our relationship with God. See what we got here. Conclusion. That's what we were waiting for. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? I hope to say that there's nothing compared to God. There's nothing as great as God. Nothing comes close. Our God is as great today as He was when He created the universe. Right? He's the same. He's as great today as He was when He brought Israel out of Egypt. Do we believe 
believe that. And he's as great today as he was when his son came to this earth and died for our sins and when he raised Jesus from the dead. It's just as great. He hasn't changed. Maybe we, as human beings, have changed to that point where we just don't see God as that. So our response to the greatness of God should always be faith in and reverence for Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's just not that first part, right? Entering into baptism for the remission of sins, but continuing on to remember that last part, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous shall live by faith. We live every day. We live out our faith as we go through this world. Hey, that's the lesson. Probably took a little more time than what I originally intended, but don't take it out of my pay, you're right. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's good to be back. It is good to be with y'all again. Thank you. Appreciate it so very much. God bless. If you have a need, let your request be made known as we stand the same.